Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is so nice to see so many familiar faces. For those that do not know me, I am Desiree Fragoso, and um, I have the privilege of serving this community as a city administrator since 2019. So welcome and nice to meet you to those that I haven't met before. Um, again, thank you all for being here this afternoon to hear about the proposed beach project, the shoal management project at the north end of the Ala Palms. This proposed project, do you want to go to under? Yes, we're, we're, if that's okay with everybody, that way we can see the slides better. Um, the project aims to address the challenges and opportunities that associated with maintaining and preserving a healthy beach, which as we all know, it's our greatest asset. During this meeting, we will provide a detailed presentation of the proposed project, highlighting its objectives, and address any concerns about any potential impacts. We understand that this is a topic of great importance to our community, and we wanna ensure that everyone has an opportunity to voice their opinions, concerns, answer any questions. That's what we're here for, so we thank you for being here. We believe that it is crucial for um, our community, community to be actively involved in any decision-making process that impacts our common shared areas, and the beach obviously is one. We have allotted about an hour for this meeting. We'll have a presentation and we'll have some time at the end, but if for some reason we do not have time to address every question or every concern, there is a page, should I go here? Oh, okay. There is a page on our website right here when, where you can submit um, a public comment. It'll go to city council and the staff and we will res respond accordingly. I do have a few ground rules that I always like to share when we have public meetings and hopefully everybody can agree to them and we can ensure that we have a productive and respectful meeting this afternoon. So just a few things, all ideas are welcome. Please listen respectfully to others. Avoid side conversations and please put your phones in mute so that we don't disrupt the meeting as it's going um, along. If you disagree, why don't you propose a solution? We'd be happy to hear it. Limit comments to three minutes at the end so that we can get through as many comments or questions as we can with the time that we have um, this afternoon. Um, and at the end of the day, I think we can all ag agree that we're here because we care and we're trying our best. While I have your attention, I do want to make a plug of Sunny. This year, the city launched an AI-powered platform that allows web and text features. So it's an, an effort that we've done to improve communications with our community, increase citizen engagement, and just facilitate the uh, sharing information process that you all need from the staff and um, it's, had, it's had great results. So here's the, uh, a barcode. I'm not gonna make you to take, off your, take out your phone and text it now, but maybe at the end of the meeting I will. But just keep it in mind, text hello to this number and you'll be able to con connect with us and get alerts of events when we have emergencies. It's just a, a pretty neat tool that we're excited to, to be working on this year. Okay. So I'll go ahead and introduce Stephen. Stephen Trainum, along with a team of scientists and engineers with Coastal Science and Engineering, has been monitoring our beach since 2007. So knows the beach very well. And they've designed and implemented dozens of nourishment projects along the coast and all the projects that we've had here on Ala Palms. He will provide an overview of the condition of the beach on the north end, explain the proposed shoal management project, then we'll have an opportunity for questions. All right, here you go, Stephen. All right, thank you very much, Desiree. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, I'll try to speak a little louder there. Um, and I'll, if I start speaking too fast, throw something at me, raise my hand, and I'll try to slow down a little bit. Um, I have a, a good bit of information that I'm going to try to get through fairly quickly, uh, just so we have as much time for questions and responses. Um, but my name is Stephen Trainum. I've been with Coastal Science and Engineering since 2007. Um, 
and our company has been around since 1984, uh, working up and down the coast of the, the East Coast, uh, every developed beach in South Carolina. We've been on the survey or done some type of uh, feasibility study or uh, restoration project. Um, so we have a long history in South Carolina. Um, and, and I will say that this meeting is something that is sponsored by the city. Um, to date, we have not, uh, the, the project that we're going to talk about has not been put on public notice by OCRM or the Corps of Engineers. Um, once the permit is put on public notice, there will be a comment period for that permit, um, and OCRM may uh, elect to have a public hearing on that permit. Um, the public hearing is a chance for OCRM to hear people's comments, but at a public hearing, there's no opportunity for feedback. You can't answer questions. Um, it's kind of a very short overview of the project. Um, so this opportunity that the city's presenting really is a better opportunity to get a little bit of back and forth and feedback um, from any co comments or concerns. So I, I think it's a great thing that the city's trying to do um, to, again, reach out to the public uh, because we know it's a, the beach is an um, important subject um, and we want everybody to, to uh, have their opportunity to be heard. Um, so some real quick background on Isle of Palms and why it looks the way it does. And I'm going to turn that mic in if that's okay. Um, Isle of Palms is a classic drumstick barrier island. It looks like a chicken drumstick where you have a, a wider um, end at the north and a skinnier spit at the south. And that's developed over thousands of years as sand has come off of the Dewey's Inlet Delta, migrated on shore, and built out that north end of the island. Sand that comes on the north end eventually works its way south, um, terminating at Breach Inlet and eventually migrating through the Breach Inlet channels and the shoals and over to Sullivan's Island. Um, and we're looking at thousands of years worth of accretion and erosion and sediment transport. Um, and there's been a lot of changes occurring recently, and recently I mean since the 1800s when um, dams were installed that changed the sediment transport rates all along the coast. Um, you have jetties being built at Sullivan's Island that's changed that. So there's a lot of, you know, different scales of changes occurring. Um, but essentially, this is the general concept. Um, and I'll talk about some of the specifics in a little bit. But as, as sand migrates on shore, it comes on shore in these packages, these shoals that detach from the inlet, migrate on shore, spread out. Some of that sand moves to the south. Some of it gets recycled back into Dewey's Inlet to reform future shoals. Um, those shoals attach every five to eight years or so, but there's a big range. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. They can be varying sizes and contain different volumes of sand. Um, but in recent years, since we've been studying the island, erosion has outpaced the natural accretion of shoals. So despite the, this kind of free sand coming onto the system, we're still losing about 100,000 cubic yards of sand every year on average from that east end. So if you're losing sand net, every once in a while you have to supplement that sand, and that's why we've done some of the um, large-scale nourishment projects. Um, let's see if this is a clicker. Um, don't think I have a laser here, but um, here's an example from Isle of Palms in 1997 of a shoal that had just attached to the beach in the center there right near the property owner's beach house, which really is generally where these shoals tend to attach, but they can move north and south. And what happens when this shoal is offshore, it's basically a breakwater um, where waves are blocked by the shoal, they refract around the edges of the shoal and create erosional hotspots or erosional arcs on either side. And this photo is kind of the textbook example of what that generally looks like, though everyone's a little different. You see the sand attaching in the middle, you see erosional arcs on either side, and if you look really closely on that shoal, you see these dark lines, that's actually where they're doing sand scraping from that shoal in 1997 um, and moving that sand to the erosional hot, hot spots. So what we're proposing with this project is very similar to things that have been going on for a long time. Looking at how do these shoals move on shore, this is an example going back from 2010 to 2014. Um, and the different colors represent the leading edge of the shoal as it's attaching to the beach. Um, it starts fr very far offshore. It moves anywhere from 700 to 1,000 feet per year on average. And as it gets closer, it also gets higher. So you start to see more and more sand exposed at low tide. Going back a little further, um, I just can't stress enough how dynamic the east end of Isle of Palms is. 
um, anywhere near an inlet or in South Carolina, you're going to have a lot of changes in the shoreline. Sometimes you'll have years of significant growth, sometimes you'll have years of significant erosion. Um, and that's all because of these varying packages of shoals uh, that attach to the beach. Um, but looking back at 1984 in this top image, this is looking at the area um, or just south of 53rd Avenue, which is on the right side of the image, um, down to 41st Avenue towards the left side of the image. Um, and the beach was a lot more eroded then. You actually had some seawalls exposed. You had some groin features that are still there, but um, buried by a lot of sand. Um, so since the 80s, that area has really accumulated a bunch of sand. Um, going even further back in time, looking at 1949, there was a very large shoal attachment event that really wrapped all the way around the eastern half of Isle of Palms, and that's what's shown on the bottom left. It, it really formed like a new lagoon um, and a new outer beach ridge, and it took over 15 years for that shoal to fully merge with the beach, that sand to spread out. Um, and all that happened before Wild Dunes was developed. And so it's been a, you know, these shoals are an ongoing process, they're variable. We understand the process, we understand kind of the general concept, but they're very diffi difficult to predict exactly when they're going to attach, what the beach response is going to be, how long it's going to take. Um, all that is very just it, it, site or uh, shoal specific. There we go. Um, just a brief history of the projects that have been done on Isla Palms. Um, 1983 was the first kind of large scale project. About 300,000 yards was pumped from the marina basin across the island uh, to the um, Wild Dunes area. Periodic sand scraping in the 80s and 90s, um, and then 2008 was the first large-scale project. The middle photo, actually all three of these photos are from that 2008 project. At that point, we had 13,000 of these large cubic yard sandbags um, across the east end of the uh, Wild Dunes area, spanning from Ship Watch to Ocean Club. Um, and we put about 900,000 yards of material there. In 2012, we did the first shoal management project, which moved 80,000 cubic yards um, to the erosional hotspot right there at Ocean Club. And then in 2014 into 2015, we did the second shoal, shoal management project, moving about 240,000 yards. And in that project, um, material came from the shoal, it came from the beach and the lee of the shoal, right behind where the shoal's attaching, and some sand also came from an area um, just north of 53rd Avenue. And then finally, the last project was 2018. 1.67 million cubic yards were placed on the Wild Dunes shoreline and south of Wild Dunes into the, um, the avenues. Um, here are a couple of photos from the 2014 uh, shoal management project. Again, that was about 240,000 cubic yards of sand. Uh, the top right image, you can see the excavators out on the shoal moving that sand um, as it's uh, coming on shore. Uh, and then before and after at the Ocean Club property, um, showing what the, you know, the kind of dramatic condition we really were we're able to start the project right as the water was starting to um, undermine the structure. The, the seawall that was built was failing at that point. Yep. And then the 2018 project, just to kind of do a, a refresher, but it was the, a very large scale project, added sand from one end to the other from um, about 57th Avenue uh, to the um, middle of the, I guess it's the 18th green now, it used to be the 18th fairway. Um, but that project was completed in 2018, so we're six years later now. Um, what's happened over the past 10 to 15 years? Um, I, I can say in, in kind of a general sense, we've seen a lot more erosion occurring up and down the state over the past 10 years than we have in previous years. Um, part of that uh, you know, is just the cyclic cycle of nature. Um, that was a little redundant, but, the, uh, but we've also had a lot of storm events occurring. Um, I'll, Click this graphic. Um, over the past decade, we've had 30 named storms impact South Carolina. There were seven FEMA declared disasters. If you look at the time period from 2000 to 2012, we only had three, and all those occurred with tropical storms in 2004. So we really had a good calm period as far as tropical systems um, up until 2012. But since 2015, it's been just about every year, and you can name off your favorite or most uh, impactful storm, but we've had a lot of them. So we've had storms. We've also had sea level rise that's really accelerated in the past 15 years. Um, this is looking at 
just water levels in Charleston Harbor. It's not any sophisticated analysis. It's really just let's plot what the NOAA is measuring in the water levels. And that yellow line is the average daily water level or hourly water level. Um, and you can see where it starts to trend up about in, in the bottom scale is the year. So right in the middle is about 2010. And it really starts to kind of trend up from zero, which is the mean. Um, and it's about six inches. So if you were to look at your NOAA tide predictions, and they'll say you have a six-foot tide predicted today. Under calm weather and without any other impacts, that's, that six-foot tide is actually going to be measured at a six-and-a-half-foot tide. So we're seeing six inches of water level above what's predicted. Um, in a couple of years, NOAA will update their predictions, and it'll look like, oh, we're back to where we're at, a six-foot tide. But when they update those predictions, you need to know that those predictions are now higher than they were 20 years ago because these predictions are based off of a, a time period from about 1980 to 2000. So that's why current measurements are, are higher than what's predicted. So again, sea level rise can be a big part of beach erosion, but a lot of times it's more sediment supply. Um, so I don't want to say it's all due to sea level rise, but it's one of the contributing factors on why we're seeing more erosion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the numbers that we're looking at with the monitoring that we've been doing and why we think that's a justification for this project. Um, we have monitoring areas that we've looked at since 2007 for the city. Um, and we're going to focus on four, five, and six are really the areas that um, we're talking about with this project. Um, so looking at just erosion, how much sand are we losing from the east end? Um, it's been fairly high. Recently, we're at about 250,000 yard, uh, yards per year if we look at what the trend is since 2018, which is very high. If we look at the trend from the 2008 project up until 2018, that was about 100,000 yards per year. So right now, the erosion has been about double what it was after the last project. Um, I will say, though, that with this shoal that's attaching now, we're about to get a lot of free sand, which will help these numbers improve um, because we should start seeing some accretion occurring with this shoal sand attaching. So as we go into the next couple of years, this 270,000 number is going to improve, but we're still losing more sand than we were after that 2008 project. Um, lately, we've had a focused erosion area um, near the, the Beachwood East area. We've also seen some significant erosion around that Ocean Club area, though it's um, not been as significant, but it's still something of concern. Um, if you've ever seen me talk before, you've seen these kind of images, but we have to, it's a rule that we have to show them. Um, but this is what the inlet looks like for the past four years, or three years. Um, and what, what you're looking at is the yellowish colors are high sand, so the beach on the, the left side, that's that solid yellow color. Um, but the shoals offshore are the kind of the greenish hues, and where it's the brightest green, um, in the middle there, that's where the shoals and the darkest blues are the channels. So the channel in 2020 was kind of deflected straight to the south. And as we move to 2021, you can see the shoals that are seaward of that channel, so closer to me from the dark blue here in the middle, is starting to move south. And a new channel is forming further to the north. As we go to the next year in 2022, that channel at the north is getting bigger. That shoal's moved further south and is starting to move inland. And then in 2023, the shoal is really starting to coalesce and get closer to the beach. Um, we're scheduled to do another survey here in the next couple of months. Um, but right now, the leading edge of that shoal is only about 400 feet from the beach at low tide. Um, so in this photo, it was closer to 1,000 feet. Um, so it's really moving very quickly. But we've been tracking that, and we have an animation going back to 2007 that really shows how this inlet's evolving. And that's the pattern that you see, these large-scale channel evolutions happening about every 10 years or so. This is currently what it looks like. Again, all the breakers that you see um, on that top photo, that's the shoal that's coming on shore. You'll see a lot of accretion occurring just behind that shoal, which is the area of Beach Club Villas and the property owner's beach house. Um, the most significant erosional arc is, is towards the top of the screen um, there at Beachwood right now, but there's a lot of sand in the shoal that reaches a lot further south. And you can actually see a little bump right in front of the Grand Pavilion where we had a small shoal attached that far south and has built the beach out in front of Grand Pavilion and continues to feed that area. Um, along the north end, we don't see any obvious um, arc, which is a good sign. Um, but 
knowing the history of that area is certainly one we want, an area we want to um, keep an eye on. Um, and I think it's important to note in that particular area, compared to where we were in 2014, which is when the last shoal management project was done, we still hold about 300,000 cubic yards more sand. So that area really is in a much better condition right now than it was um, in 2014 when we were looking at the last project. And then this is looking at 53rd Avenue and south. So 53rd Avenue is right here at the bottom of the image. Um, and then looking south. And this, sand, this area has really accreted um, in the past 15 years since the 2008 project, um, but especially since 2018. We're seeing a, a wide um, inter, or kind of ephemeral dune system forming, um, dry sand beach, and, and really a protrusion of the shoreline sticking out into the water compared to the adjacent areas. And that'll be important as we talk about the potential harvesting. So the, the purpose of the shoal management project, there's, there's a lot of um, positives out of it. Not saying that there's no negatives, but there's, there's a lot of positives that we're focused on. Why would we do this? Um, and some of those are, we're, we're trying to expedite this shoal process. You know, as the shoal kind of sits close to the beach is when it's having most of the impact. So the faster we can get it to merge uh, and get that sand to form more of a straight um, shoreline, uh, the better it will be for these hotspot erosion areas. Um, we can offer um, restoration of the critically eroded areas, um, improving public access so that at all tides there is a sandy beach to walk around. Uh, there's places right now that at high tide there's armor stone or sandbags. Um, so this type of project will, will help aid in um, having a, a beach there that you can get to at all tides. Um, improving the dune system, allowing emergency measures to be removed. Um, so the sandbags would be coming out as part of this project. Um, and also, and, and this is something I, I really um, want to kind of emphasize, is this permit is, is a tool that the city can have to respond to the, what's going on on the beach. Um, by having a permit, the city is not required to actually act on that permit, but it gives them permission and the ability to act should the conditions warrant a project. Um, so a, a permit is good for five years. So we're trying to forecast what could the beach look like any time between the time the permit's issued and five years after that point that would justify or impact the way we would design a project. Um, so we're, we're really trying to give the city a tool to manage these shoals and the, what the beach looks like um, over that five-year period and really trying to do that guessing, you know, based off of how these shoals are attaching, which, as you've seen, is kind of a difficult thing to do. Um, so one thing that it would allow is, you know, should you know, things look good one year, okay, great, you don't need to do anything, but if a major storm hits, it's a tool that the city could quickly turn to to respond to that storm and do some, some type of restoration. Um, and then a, another big part is it can extend the life of a large-scale dredging project. So if we're looking to restore the beach, you have very few options on what you can do as a community. Um, you can do very small-scale restoration, like trucking in some sand just for some minor dune work, um, that can be a little expensive, and especially as you start to get to high volumes, like we're talking about here. Um, you're looking at you know, $40 to $50 per cubic yard of sand to truck it in from an inlet pit. Um, sh moving sand on the beach typically can be done for 4 to $5 per yard, so you're an you know, order of magnitude difference there. Um, but the other option is the large-scale project, where you're bringing in a dredge, um, dredges typically cost four to five million dollars in mobilization just to get it on site. And then you're moving sand at you know, 10 to 12 dollars per cubic yard. Um, so if we can extend the life of a dredging project to really focus um, these moder modest scale restoration efforts, um, you know, if we have a, a relatively short area impacted that we can kind of restore or fix with these interim projects, then we can push out the large-scale projects where you're spending all that mobilization. Um, they may be out there working in the summer, so you may have impacts to rentals and things like that. Um, and in some cases, you know, the quantity of sand in the entire system really isn't the issue. It's a very localized point. So, you know, at, at some volume or some area of impact, it makes more sense to kind of just focus on that area and not unnecessarily fill areas that are already, you know, pretty healthy. Um, so, and a lot of that depends on where the shoals are at the point. So it's, it's a flexible tool to, for the city to be able to have kind of in their toolbox 
to manage some of these erosion issues in that area. Um, and we're also, you know, we're not focusing on that in this meeting, but we're also looking at a similar type permit and project at the south end using sand from the, um, the breach inlet shoals and spit to, to be able to, again, have a tool to manage ish, erosion issues in that area. Um, so that's for potentially a later date. Um, so now into some of the project details. Um, this is what the permit drawing will look like, and it shows the potential harvest areas, um, one of them being near the uh, shoal attachment site, and you notice it's a pretty wide range because we don't know exactly where the shoal is going to attach. Um, so we, we need to, again, anticipate what may it look like in five years and cover that in this permit application. And you'll notice the fill area is right behind where the, the harvest area is. The, the harvest areas are the red, the fill areas are the green. So the one at Beechwood is literally behind it because we may be out on the shoal and literally moving sand back behind it. Um, and then there's also a fill area up at the, the north end. Um, the harvest area uh, towards the south end in the avenues um, starts around 44th Avenue and goes up to 53rd Avenue. So some of the, the details of that, the permit would allow um, up to two events totaling a total of 400,000 cubic yards. Um, so one permit would allow for these two multiple events. Any single event would be limited to 250,000 cubic yards, and that's done for a couple of reasons. One is um, just the availability, the quantity of sand that can be harvested. Um, Another is looking at the timeline on how long that would take. We don't want a project that's out there for six months doing work. Um, so that's a, a condition on that. Um, the shoal attachment site, so if we flip back one, this northern red area, that really is our priority borrow area. Um, if any way possible, we want to use that area for harvesting sand because that's where sand's coming onto the beach and that's really the cause of the problem. Um, so if, if it's accessible by land-based equipment, that would be where we would get sand from. Um, the area along the avenues, we've included a limit of up to 100,000 cubic yards to be harvested from that. Um, again, that would be kind of the backup area. If, if shoal sand wasn't available and there was some type of just critical ero erosion situation that warranted it, then we would use the, the avenues um, for a bar area. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, work would be restricted to winter months unless DNR and Fish and Wildlife recommended a window that was different to accommodate shorebirds because they too tend to be around more during the winter. Um, but likely in the October to December time period is kind of where they prefer that, um, which is fall, but um, cold weather months. Um, it would be land-based equipment. Um, if it's kind of a full-scale project, we would anticipate two to three months of construction. Um, I mentioned um, that one. Along the avenues, we've in included a 600-foot buffer from any harvesting. So we, you look at your structure line where the houses are, no work would be able to be done within 600 feet um, of those structures, and all the work would be restricted to the wet sand beach. So we wouldn't be digging up the dry sand beach, we wouldn't be digging up dunes or anything like that. It would be out on the wet sand. Um, and during the project, most of the beach will be open to the public. Now there may be trucks going back and forth and um, we may have corridors where the public can walk on the, the high tide beach. Um, right along the fill area where they're dumping sand, we would probably close the beach for safety reasons. Uh, but the majority of the beach, even within the project area, would be open during construction. So the Down Coast area, and Down Coast is what we generally refer to as anywhere kind of south of 53rd Avenue, and that includes our potential harvest area um, along the um, 44th to 53rd Avenue. Um, that area, we, we've been monitoring the volume since 2009. Um, since then, it's gained up reach four, again, which is this part, um, has gained almost a million cubic yards of sand since 2009. Uh, reach three, which starts at the pier and, and goes north, has gained another 250,000 yards. Um, since 2018, reach four, or just the area within where we propose to have that harvest area, has gained almost 400,000 cubic yards. So 
you know, the permit would allow up to 100,000 yards of that sand to be recycled back to the north. Um, and what that works out to is about 33 cubic yards per foot. So on this top image on the graph, you can see since 2009, reach four's volume. That's unit volume per foot of beach. Um, so it's been increasing just about every single year since 2009. It was one or two years around Hurricanes Matthew and Irma where it lost just a little bit of sand, um, but it has really been accreting, and especially since 2018. So that, that kind of darker blue bar in the middle is the 2018 condition. Since then, it's really jumped up. So if we were to take and harvest all of that permitted sand, that 100,000 yards, from that area, it would reduce the volume back down to about where it was two years ago. Um, which is still well above where it was in 2018. Um, so I, I say that just to kind of provide a scale of what, what really are we talking about, because you know, 100,000 cubic yards is kind of a, uh, an abstract number if you're not used to dealing with it. Um, but we would, I, I kind of drew a red arrow there on where we would likely drop back to if we took the full 100,000 yards out of that. Um, we would fully expect, right after that project, for the sand to continue to accrete like it has historically um, so over the next couple of years, that sand would come back through the system uh, and you would see the similar types of accretion. This is what the 2014 project looked like. On the left side of the image, you can see, and I know it's going to be a little difficult in the back, um, but I'm sure this will be posted on the city's website so you can go through and look at it a little clearer. Um, but the harvest area is right in the middle of the um, photo. And you see these little dots. That's where the excavator came in, harvested sand, loaded it into trucks, and moved it to the north. The right photo was that same area six weeks later. Um, you really can't tell anything was done there. Um, there is a natural ridge and runnel system, so you see a, a little bit of a runnel through the, burnt, or through the intertidal beach. But really, it restored itself very closely. We saw a little bit of erosion of the, um, the high tide line. Uh, and you can see a little arc kind of in the right around the bottom third of that image. Um, and then that quickly started to rebuild itself. So there will be some initial kind of setback of the high tide line by harvesting sand from that area. Um, and we're estimating that to be up to 50 feet from where the current high tide line is. Um, and based off of the, the unit volumes that could be um, harvested under the permit as it's written now. Looking at, this is a, so right within that harvest area, if you can imagine a cross section of the beach, this is what it would look like from the dune on the left um, out underwater and we're about 10 or 12 feet deep on the right side of the graph. And what that shows is the green line is what that cross section looked like right before the project in September 2014. And then the purple line is what it looked like immediately after the project in March. And you can see that the, the dry sand beach eroded between that green and the purple line. And I, I have the arrows there to kind of highlight it. Um, but then by August, which is the blue line, the dry sand beach almost restored back to where it was the prior year. Um, by August 2016, so a little over a year later, it really was back almost at the exact same position. Um, so it was fairly quick recovery uh, you know, of the actual beach width in that area. So I'm almost done here, just um, wanted to kind of give an overview. Again, this project is a tool that the city would have in their toolbox to manage the sand supply on all the palms. That really is our goal, is when we look at the beach, we're looking at you know, the entire shoreline and trying to maintain a dry sand beach and a healthy beach across the entire island, um, working with these dynamic shoals. You know, if this is a long straight beach in the Grand Strand and you don't have any you know, big inlets, it's, it's pretty easy. You have consistent erosion. Um, you don't have to worry about the uncertainty um, that we have here. But we have it here. Um, but there's a lot of things going on right now. Um, at the south end, the Corps is getting ready to start a beneficial use project. So they're going to be dredging material um, from the spoil islands. I know that's not the correct term, the disposal islands on the uh, intercoastal waterway. Um, they're going to be pumping that material over to the south end between 2nd Avenue and 10th Avenue. Um, that project has been awarded, and they should be starting moving equipment in there any day now. You, you've actually probably seen the dredge pipe, so some of the material is already there, but they haven't actually started kind of doing the digging yet. 
Um, but I would think within the next month, we might actually start seeing some sand on the beach in that area. Um, the city has issued a, or put in a permit application to take some of the sand that the Corps placed and redistribute that to, to offer some immediate dune restoration, because that's not part of the core plan. So we're going to try to restore some of the dunes along the south end that have been eroded the past year, um, and also move some sand into some of the, the areas that have been critically eroded um, since about mid-2023. Um, so that's going on right now. That permit is being reviewed, and hopefully we'll have that very soon. Um, but that project will be going on throughout most of the summer. Um, so if you want to watch big trucks on the beach uh, or sand flowing out of a pipe, go take a visit to it. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns, um, we're happy to help, but direct them to the core. No, just kidding. It's, we're happy to help any way we can, and the city's very um, involved with what's going on there. So uh, we have this project, which again, the permit application has been submitted, but it's not on public notice yet. You will have the opportunity to submit comments to the core and to um, OCRM. Um, and we would respond to those comments, you know, and try to answer questions, provide any ad additional information that we could um, through that process, or you're certainly welcome to, you know, submit comments directly um, through the website that does Ray mention. Um, and then finally, we are starting to work towards the next large scale nourishment. Um, again, the permits are good for five years, so we're trying to get uh, ahead of that as quickly as we can. And we're doing some of the initial geotechnical work, which is we're looking for sand offshore. That's kind of the biggest um, aspect of doing these designs is finding a suitable bar area. And we're working very closely with the State Historic Preservation Office because there's some cultural resources offshore, some old shipwrecks that were used for a blockade of Charleston Harbor in the Civil War that we're trying to work with SHPO to locate or make sure we're working around. Um, and making sure we're finding, you know, really beach compatible material to place on the beach. Um, so that part's working, or we're in that process now. Um, that'll take a couple more months to get all that data together. Uh, and then we'll be working on a permit application for both the east end, north end, and the south end for large scale restoration. Again, wh when do we actually pull the trigger on a project? Well, that'll be determined by, you know, future monitoring um, and, you know, just what the beach condition is looking like at that point. Um, so I think with that, that's all the questions uh, or all the um, information I had, and I'll let Desiree take over from here. Thank you, Stephen. We appreciate all the work you do on, uh, for our behalf. <laughs> we do have some time for questions, so if there, anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. We can, Douglas, can you grab that mic? and? We can move it around and um, hopefully we can answer. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll research and get back to you, sir. there would be a large-scale offshore renourishment similar to the one in 2017, I believe it was, at about 2027. He also said there's not enough sand offshore to do that project, and that there's far from enough money to do it. Could you respond to that? Um, I'll, I'll respond to part of it. Um, I'll let Desiree respond to the money part, but there, we're, we're, there's a lot of sand offshore of Isla Palms. Um, the issue is there's, um, a, a, as I mentioned, the, there's historical artifacts. There's also a lot of areas of mud and shell that we would have to work around. Um, so we're looking for suitable bar areas. So I'm not concerned about the quantity of sand. Um, I think that timeline is realistic, but what we're lo really looking for is getting a permit application put together, you know, on a pretty quick, time frame so that we have flexibility and we can really look at the conditions, look at what the monitoring results show, really look at how this shoal is, is attaching right now and what it's going to do over the next 12 to 18 months because that's going to have a big impact on what, how many more years we'll get out of this last project. Um, so in, in the optimistic terms, maybe we can push out a, uh, the next big project, you know, four, five, six years, but if you know, we have a lot more erosion than, and this shoal really doesn't do a whole lot for us uh, or moves away pretty quickly than, you know, maybe a, a little quicker time frame.
Yes, sir. Uh, the money part. Oh, uh, for the, what was the, the other part of your question about the cost? Was it about the cost? About $20 million, and currently we only have $80 million. So the cities, we have performed beach for nourishment projects in the past. As you can see, the one in 20, 2008 was about $10 million. In 2018, the project that the city did in coordination and in partnership with the Wild Dunes was $15 million. And the city's contribution for that project was about 18%. Um, and the reason why the reason why that the city's contribution was that it it was in partly in due to um, state grants that the city received in FEMA because we were able to monitor the beach after uh, several hurricanes, so we were able to get that money. So if you think about long term, if we're looking at large scale offshore dredging projects, both in the north end and the south end, where we have not had the need to do projects before. The, the projects in Waldoons are cost shared between the city and uh, the Waldoons Community Association. The ones outside of the city, we don't have a model yet. So in terms of the, the need that the city is going to have, um, it's significant. When you look at, when you're talking about 15 million for one project every 10 years, you double that. We're looking at about 20, maybe 18 to 20 million dollars for, for two large scale projects. Um, our goal is to coordinate both so that we only pay for the mobilization um, cost once, but with a beach preservation fee fund that generates about a million five every year, there is, there is potentially a gap that the city, the city and city council will need to identify how to meet that, uh, make that gap. Thank you. Sir? <clears throat> you want that? Okay. So, so we saw the accretion in the middle and part of the island. So you're talking about taking some of that and then replenishing other areas of the beach with that. My question to you is, when you see a net benefit onto the island like that, wouldn't it be best, I'm just curious, wouldn't it be best to leave those accretions alone, since that's a net positive onto the island? deal with the shell issue, and begin moving some of that. It's, it almost sounds like you're shuffling sand back and forth all the time on the island itself, rather than leaving the positive alone, moving more positive materials in. And, and as I recall, I have to go back many, many years. I do remember all the sandbags up there on, on Ocean Isle. That, that was exciting. Uh, but the question is, I think the Army Corps of Engineers built somewhat of a jetty system out there. I've sailed up and down several times. I know that it's not very deep out there at all. Uh, and so you mentioned groins. Are there submerged groins out there? And if so, are they assisting? Do we need to add more groins, perhaps? What are the mechanical things that we can do that would lower the impact when we see a major nor'easter come through like we did last year. Because we, we need to be a little bit more proactive rather than just looking at this whole thing shifting, getting out the big shovels and moving sand that's already moved ashore. I just think it's positive when it moves ashore, just like that shoal you have. If you get that up there, how do we protect that from going back out? Yep. Or is it just a natural process that you can't avoid? Yeah, thank you. That, that's a lot of good comments and, and observations. I'll, I'll try to hit everything. But um, so I, I agree with you completely. Adding sand to the system, you know, from an outside source is the ideal situation. You're, you're increasing the amount of sand in your sandbox, which, you know, is the ideal condition. However, the only way to do that is either for these type of quantities is the offshore dredging, which is a very expensive option, but a necessary one at some interval. Um, you know, for, you, you have to kind of ask the question, if we have a thousand feet of beach eroded, is it worth spending the 20 million for that? Or do we need to wait until it's, you know, we see a larger deficit across a larger area? Um, so that, that's the, the big tool, that, the big shovel that we would use on a, as an infrequent basis as necessary, because again, you have the $5 million, you know, mobilization just to get the dredge here. So if we can extend those projects, you're reducing the number of mobilizations that you have to pay over time. And also just, you know, the impacts to equipment on the beach. Um, these recycling sand from the accretional area, I, again, I, I fully understand, hey, you've got a great, 
huge wide beach. I love huge beaches everywhere. Um, but when we're looking at it as what are our options, again, if we can get to the shoal to use that sand, that's the preferred alternative. We would do that. Um, we would really be leaving that area on, on a, as just almost an emergency type, hey, we need some sand, you know, to avoid, you know, huge costs with sandbags or some other type of, you know, kind of critical emergency situation. But we also have the, tr the thresholds in there that if that area ever got to a point where we didn't have the 600 foot buffer, we wouldn't take sand from there anyway. Because, I mean, I know my career would be very short if we're taking sand from one person at the expense of another. Um, that wouldn't go over very well for a long time. So we really think we, we created and designed this project using the, the volumes that we were able to measure and document um, and the current condition to make sure that we're leaving everywhere protected. Um, and, and so we feel like that 100,000 number is an appropriate number to, again, use kind of as a, a last ditch effort. That, that's not the best term for it, but um, to, to help supplement and you know, buy some time until maybe it's buying time until other emergency measures can be put in. As far as groins go, groins can be very effective at reducing erosion rates, um, but they work a lot better in areas where you have a consistent direction of sediment transport, meaning you have sand always moving to the south or always moving to the north. Here, with the way the shoals attach, some points during you know, one year, you may have a lot of sand going to the south, and then as the shoal attaches, kind of sp speaking as beech wood is the example, sand's actually going to the north behind the shoal. So you may have, your, your sand's going in both directions. So a single groin certainly wouldn't be near as effective. Um, multiple groins through that area could help kind of eliminate some of that impact. Um, but it, with, with the inlet system and the shoals, it's not as predictable as kind of a long straight beach with the groins. I think I've answered most of those, but we'll, we'll move on and talk later. Yes. And this is for the benefit of the streaming audience. I still don't understand how soon it will be before Beachwood East will see some help in getting protection for our houses. The high tides that occur with actually hardly any you know, wind effects are already going up and to and over the sandbags. People have to camp out in front of us because they want to enjoy the beautiful beach that isn't there. How soon do you think we're going to get some relief? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of things in the works. If we're looking at trying to add a couple more sandbags, another layer um, in areas where the sandbags have slumped. Now those sandbags I think have performed much better than some of the cube sandbags that have been tried before. The small ones? The, no, not the, yeah, the, the white ones that will tend to roll over or deteriorate with the sun. Um, so that should be happening in the next several weeks um, to kind of reinforce the wall uh, or the revetment with the sandbags. Um, for this particular project, if the permitting goes through fairly quickly, we could be looking at the first project this upcoming winter season. Um, that's, we're not going to be able to do work during sea turtle season for sure, and the permit wouldn't be issued that quickly anyway. Um, but there's, there's a fair chance that with the way the shoal's attaching, we may see some natural recovery in that area at some point. I don't want to say it's in the next five to six months, um, but maybe shortly thereafter there may be some natural recovery. Um, and if there's significant recovery, it may eliminate the need to do, you know, a shoal project. We, that's something we would want to monitor at the time. But that's the best answer I can give you right now. Yeah, I, I understand the concern. I, I think you know, my advice would be to focus on the protection right now until the erosion pressure is relieved one way or the other. So before you try to build back things that are still going to be vulnerable, let's focus on you know, trying to just kind of hold the line where we're at. Um, but you'd really have to look at it as a, on a case-by-case -case basis and maybe consult with a, you know, 
local in structural engineer or something if you have particular concerns over your property. Well, we can't get permits because they keep tossing it back and forth just to try to rebuild the way it was. What do we do? I'm not sure. That may be a better question for the city's building <laughs> department um, you know, for your particular situation. A program here. I just want to be get it accurate. Are you suggesting that you are taking the sand, harvesting the sand from what 40 what to 53rd? I think 44th, if I okay. remember correctly. So that's where you're going to harvest it. Where is your proposal of where you're going to put that sand? Are you putting it back on the Isle of Palms or are you putting it on the private wild dunes? Um, the sand would be placed in the eroded areas within the, what was shown on the permit, so the Beachwood East area, um, potentially to the Ocean Club area. Um, I would not think that sand from the avenues would go all the way up to Ocean Club. I think that's more if the shoal sand would be accessible. Um, I, I understand that. <laughs> well. So, well, you're, it, it's a very good observation, um, a very good question. So sand's going to continue to move from those avenues south. So from that harvest area, if we take sand out, that's not going to stop sand from moving south. It still will be moving south over time. Right, we're, we're proposing up to 100,000 yards. Now, the benefit to that area is... Right now it has a sand surplus, and that surplus originated from sand that was placed in these projects. We would be recycling that sand back to an area where it would eventually move back to the same area it was harvested. So basically putting it back up at the head of the stream so that it'll move back through that system over time. Now I can't, I can't say... I'm not sure if um, I'm following. The 2018 project was the offshore dredging project. Right. Are you referring to the 2014 project? Well, 2018. Yeah. You got the permits to include the whole island in order to get the permits in order to get the funding from uh, the state and the federal. Well, that's, uh, any of the sand that been, has been placed in Wadoon is working its way down the island. And we were able to track that million yards that has accumulated in Reach 4. Um, 250,000 yards in reach three, and you see the signature of accretion. If you look at the data in a different way, you can actually kind of see a wave moving down the beach. As you get closer to the pier, that wave kind of, you lose the signal more, but there's certainly sand that's moving there. Now, you deal with gross sand transport, so how much sand is moving every day, both directions, and then you look at net sand transport, which how much is actually accumulating over time. Um, and so we can see that, you know, in reaches three and four, whatever's leaving is being replaced and even more so by the sand that's coming into it. As you get further down the island, it's more balanced where whatever's leaving is being replaced by the amount that's, that's coming into it. So it's, it's more of an even system. Um, up until the past two years, that south end has been pretty stable or accretional. Um, and then the past two years really took a hit. Um, it went from, I think we lost a net of 6,000 yards from 2009 until 2020 at the very south end of the island, and then it jumped up to 300,000 yards in the past two years. So, Those plans are necessary. It's just you never made a plan for Well, we included this. We included. It would be yeah. happy to talk to you about more and have to say yes. that. Thank you for your comments. Um, thank you all for coming to the meeting. If anybody wants to talk to us um, after, after we close, we'd we'll be happy to, to, to answer any uh, follow-up questions. My card is right there, so if anybody wants to email me, um, let me know. And I also brought some magnets about Sunny. So I'm just making a shameless plug for Sunny. Please grab them. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your attendance and your engagement. Um, and I hope it